The Falsified Jesus During his first homily as Pope, Pope Francis said, My wish is that all of us have the courage to build the church on the Lord's blood, which was poured out on the cross, and to profess the one glory, Christ crucified. The one glory? The crucified Christ? A terrible death by torture as the one glory? Is not the glory the fact that Christ overcame death, that he resurrected? Today we would say that he dematerialized his body, and thus showed that he is beyond matter. Why then is the death of his earthly body, which is, after all, only a temporary transient manifestation of the eternal divine spirit being, praised as the one glory? The resurrected Christ seems to be rather a foreign body in the churches, except at Easter. So there they do not show, or only very rarely, a picture or a statue of the living Jesus of Nazareth, but instead mostly the crucifix with the body of Jesus of Nazareth bleeding under terrible suffering, maltreated and dying. One wonders, why is the death of the body of Jesus of Nazareth venerated in the churches and not his life? One reason is this, because allegedly only in this way would redemption have been possible. This thinking was taken over from the old pagan cults of blood sacrifice, Back then, the gods, or the god in question, had to be appeased or reconciled by a bloody animal or even human sacrifice. This pagan thinking from the time of polytheism also penetrated into Judaism and from there into the institution of the church. Thus the horrible death of Jesus of Nazareth has been celebrated in church institutions for centuries as a sin offering. According to their teachings, the God in whom the churches believe had demanded this sacrifice, the death of his own son by torture, utterly incredible, but true. During public appearances, Pope John Paul II very often demonstratively carried in front of him a crucifix on a staff, with a particularly cruelly bent, hanging and dying body of Jesus of Nazareth. For this purpose, the priests even invented their own foreign word, the ferula, a staff to the upper end of which a crucifix is attached, and which, in the Catholic cult, only the Pope is allowed to carry. Earliest illustrations show the ferula on top with a small ball. In ancient times, the ball of a scepter stood for the globe over which the bearer exercised dominion on behalf of the gods. Pope Paul VI commissioned the sculptor Lello Scortelli to make a ferula with the crucified one. The finished work was described by Paul VI as powerful and expressive, a slingshot stretched toward heaven. A slingshot stretched toward heaven? What did he mean by that? Whom does he want to shoot into space with it? We don't know. It will probably remain his secret, one of many in the church. All successors of Paul VI adopted the new staff with the cross. Pope Benedict XVI consistently continued the use of the ferula introduced by Paul VI even during celebrations of the Mass. The sculptor Lello Scortelli, the maker of the controversial figure, proudly says, Thus the Pope holds in his hands the sole true scepter, the most powerful sign of victory, triumph and dominion on earth. The cross, meaning the crucifix. Jesus dying on the cross as a sign of triumph? A triumph for whom? But what sensation does this hanging, torn and maltreated body on the Pope's staff evoke? Would one depict a loved one in such a way? Let's assume that someone we love were to fall seriously ill, and in the last hours before dying, already emaciated to a skeleton, tossed around in bed with unimaginable pain. Would we then take a photo of these death throes and hang it up at home? Or even commission a sculptor of this situation? Would we hang the body of this loved one writhing in pain and suffering around our necks as a small figurine and ornament in remembrance, 
or carry it before us on a staff, almost as if in triumph? Wouldn't that be a mockery of our loved one? And wouldn't the accusation be raised that we couldn't possibly have loved this person, because we are now displaying him or her so cynically and irreverently? Doesn't the staff with the cross, or the ferula, remind us of the behaviour of warring tribes, when they impaled the heads or scalps of their slain opponents and carried them triumphantly before them? And in the same sense, one could think of the crucifix as a hunting trophy, such as deer antlers that some people hang on their walls. Or are these comparisons too drastic? We will see. On Friday, September the 14th, 2018, Pope Francis spoke at early Mass about the cross as a sign of victory, but added, We must not be afraid to contemplate the cross as a moment of defeat, of failure. According to the Church Fathers, the Pope continued, Satan was happy on Good Friday. He saw Jesus in his great defeat, miserably torn. So that was Satan's point of view. But what is the view of today's popes? Do they see Jesus just like the demons, as a loser in his great defeat, miserably torn apart? Why do people call the oversized crucifixes with the dying body of Jesus of Nazareth, which hang under the arches in many churches and cathedrals, triumphal crosses? Why do they not see the cross without the executed body of Jesus of Nazareth, the resurrection cross, as a triumphal cross, as a symbol of victory? Everyone can make up their own mind about this in the following. According to an article in the Süddeutsche Zeitung newspaper of August the 19th, 1995, the Protestant bishop Maria Jepsen said about crucifixes in classrooms, also, for pedagogical reasons, I consider a crucifix, that is, the constant sight of a tortured human being, in elementary school classrooms, to be at least highly questionable. If I had children of my own, I would not hang such a cross in the children's room. But it is not only for children that the sight of a maltreated, bleeding and dying human being is problematic. Shouldn't it give us pause for thought that the mission of the church in the Far East failed not least because most Asians could not, with the best will in the world, accept a religion that carried a dead man on display as the promise of a fulfilled life in God. The author, Tim Challies, considers still another aspect to be a problem. He writes, The pathos of the crucifix obscures the glory of Christ, for it hides the fact of his deity, his victory on the cross, and his present kingdom. He writes further that the crucifix conceals his divine strength. It depicts the reality of his pain, but keeps out of our sight the reality of his joy and his power. In both these cases, the symbol is unworthy. This is probably how the first Christians saw it, because in the first centuries there is no representation of Jesus suffering on the cross. In the Basilica of Santa Polinare in Uovo, south of Ravenna, which was built between 533 and 549, and also in other early Christian buildings in Ravenna, for example, only the victory cross is shown in the mosaics as a golden sign of the resurrection, with the letters Alpha and Omega on each side. In these early Christian buildings, there are wonderful Christian motifs to admire, but never the crucified one, always only representations of the resurrected one. Isn't there a completely different wind blowing here? Let us contemplate for a moment this magnificent mosaic with nature and animals and with the risen Christ.
don't these images have an uplifting effect on our disposition? On the other hand, the image of the alleged defeat, the death on the cross, falsifies the true meaning of the life of Jesus. And this falsification is brought to the attention of billions of people every day, similar to brainwashing, in that a crucifix can be seen in many places and in many rooms. In some Catholic areas, it seems to be almost omnipresent. The resurrection cross would certainly have a different effect on people. Those who look to the symbol of spiritual victory would be more motivated to follow Jesus of Nazareth, and thus consciously walk the inner path that Jesus taught. Massive criticism of the crucifix also comes from a former Roman Catholic priest. As a member of the Jesuit order, Dr. Alberto Rivera has seen and experienced a great deal. He said that the crucifixion of Jesus brings forgiveness and life, but the crucifix, he said, is a symbol of vengeance and death. He even called the crucifix a devilish tool. Literally, he wrote, The crucifix is worshipped, even idolised, by Catholics, but it is the centre of the occult. Behind it are strong demonic powers, and from these comes the power that surrounds this cross. At first glance, these statements seem like a bit much. What makes him associate the crucified Jesus with demonic forces? Indeed, even to call the crucifix a devilish tool. Actually, one understands better what he is probably trying to say if one takes a look at the past centuries to see how the crucifix was used and what purpose it served, and still serves to some extent. For example, it was used to incite believers to participate in crusades, to murder those of other faiths. For instance, the Catholic hate preachers obviously found it very useful to have in their hands a cross with the dying body of Jesus of Nazareth. Why? In this way, the preachers could make it seem that Jesus also wants it that way and stands behind their words. In this way, they could impute all murderous and criminal deeds to him as something he wanted. The agitators thus gave the impression that they were speaking as God's representatives in the spirit of Jesus of Nazareth, as if Jesus were speaking through them. This mockery of the Son of God can hardly be surpassed, for Jesus of Nazareth proclaimed and exemplified the love for neighbor and a teaching of peace. But even this, his teaching of peace, was turned into its opposite. Thus, in 1095, Pope Urban II called for an armed Catholic pilgrimage in Clermont, Auvergne, later called significantly Crusades, in its original meaning, to take up the cross, to conquer Palestine, and in his sermons, he deliberately twisted the meaning of the words of Jesus of Nazareth, so that he could persuade people to participate in the crusade, with the following words, But if love for children, relatives, or wives holds you back, realize what the Lord says in the Gospel. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. When you attack the enemies, all in the army of God will shout this one thing, Deus lo vult, Deus lo vult. Let this cry now be your watchword in battle, for this word has God spoken. With such sermons under a large crucifix, or with the crucifix in hand, and the cry, Deus lo vult, meaning God wills it, the Pope suggested to the faithful the absurd view that this war against dissenters in Palestine was God's will. Bernard of Clairvaux, canonized by the Catholic Church and still highly revered today, also abused Christ in his sermons. Literally, he preached with a crucifix beside him. The knight of Christ, I say, may strike with confidence and die yet more confidently, for he serves Christ when he strikes and serves himself when he falls. When he inflicts death, it is to Christ's profit, and when he suffers death, it is for his own gain. 
The Christian glories in the death of the pagan because Christ is glorified. Therefore set out on this path for the forgiveness of your sins. Incomparable glory is assured for you in the kingdom of heaven. These unbelievers you meet there are backward and ignorant. They are like a plague threatening our peaceful and humanitarian religion of love for neighbor. Therefore, you must strike them down with all the means at your disposal. And once again the question, is it possible to pervert and mock the name, the life and the teaching of love for neighbor of Jesus of Nazareth even more maliciously, even more devilishly? The author Friedrich Schornstein writes in his book Finale à Montségur, The End at Montségur, which deals with the fate of the Cathar community of faith in southern France. If God should really have wanted it, as Urban II had claimed at the Council of Clermont in November 1095, then a huge, unbridgeable gulf must have opened up between God and his son Jesus. Because Jesus certainly did not want this. No, he clearly and unmistakably disapproved of such behavior. Or did there exist, as the Cathars taught, the evil God they rejected? Those who call themselves his representatives on earth have disregarded all his words. Were they not, after all, as the Cathars believed, representatives of only that evil God? In this sense, there is probably not only a falsified Jesus, but also a falsified God. But of that, more later. And as contemporary engravings and paintings show, these alleged representatives of God usually held a crucifix during their hate sermons, or placed themselves below or next to a representation of the suffering Jesus on the cross. Perhaps we now understand the words of the former Jesuit, Dr. Alberto Rivera, who called the crucifix a devilish tool, behind which dark powers were standing. In principle, he thus got to the heart of these historical facts. The crucifix was also at the forefront of many other murders of innocent people. Just think of the burning alive of thousands of innocent women and men during the so-called witch hunts, or the torture and execution of millions of innocent people during the Inquisition, which lasted 600 years. There too, one can see in many engravings and paintings how a crucifix was held in front of the victim's nose on the burning pyre. Also during the ceremonial processions to the execution sites, large crucifixes were carried at the front. When the church's beadles murdered, or as it is called in Catholic parlance, eradicated the last 200 Cathars who remained of this once great early Christian community in southern France, the priests triumphantly held aloft their crucifixes, while the followers of Christ burned alive in unimaginable pain. What could happen to one in those days if one did not immediately prostrate oneself before the priest with the crucifix and the host, 
was experienced by the Dutch petty merchant Simon de Kramer in 1553. He remained standing upright and did not fall submissively on his knees when the priests passed by with the crucifix and the host. As you can see well in this old drawing, this was his death sentence. The church power then had him arrested and after being sentenced by a judge dependent on it, burned alive. As we can see from the example of the petty merchant Simon, there were also rebellious citizens in the late Middle Ages who were critical of the clergy and criticized their behavior. A caricature with a poem from 1664 proves it. It bears the title, The Lord and His Servant. The Lord refers to Christ riding on a donkey and His Servant refers to the Pope riding on horseback. The text under the drawing, which was spread throughout the centuries in different text variations, reads in one of the versions as follows. Unfortunately, the verses rhyme only in the German language, but that does not change the volatile content. The Lord on a poor beast, the servant with the highest splendor and adornment. The Lord wears a crown of thorns, the servant a triple crown of gold. The Lord was poor in this world, the servant has great power and money. The Lord has no place to lay his head, the servant is carried on shoulders. The Lord washed the disciples' feet, the servant had his kissed. The Lord suffered much shame and mockery, the servant has himself honored as God. The Lord gives blessings of peace and joy. The servant curses and repents of nothing. The Lord was persecuted and crucified. The servant cast out and murdered ever after. The Lord is our Prince of Peace. The servant always thirsts for blood. The Lord remains our faithful shepherd. The servant prefers to wage great wars. The Lord commanded to put away your sword. The servant slaughters and devours the flock. The Lord lives humbly and arduously. The servant rises above it all. The Lord was at once meek. The servant leads a worldly kingdom. The Lord admonishes to keep the commandments. The servant has abolished them. The Lord loves all people equally, the servant only those who are like him and rich. The Lord he respects all genders, the servant however the woman despises. The Lord he died as sacrificial lamb, the servant took the lives of millions. The Lord brought redemption to humankind, the servant turned them to ashes at the stake. The Lord seeks all those lost. The servant curses them to hell. The master's speech warned against mammon. The servant called it God's wealth. Therefore, notice from this example whether their doctrine and life are comparable. You see through it and quickly realize how different they both are. And see and say it freely that the servant is the adversary the one whose soul and blessedness are earnest unto glory, will serve the Lord Christ and reject the Antichrist. The content of the rhymes is all the more astonishing when one considers that during this time the Inquisition was raging, whose bloody regime continued into the 18th century. Also during the genocide of the Indians, one can see in old engravings and drawings how the leaders of the people, some of whom were burned alive at the stake, had the crucifix held under their noses. Thus the Prince of Peace was and is misused for satanic purposes. Even in the 20th and still in the 21st century, weapons and bombs were still blessed with the crucifix. 
the son of a German soldier who took part in the Russian campaign in World War II, knew how to tell about his father. He didn't tell me much about the war, but he did describe one thing to me vividly. Before the big offensive against the East started, the tanks were lined up and the priest walked by along them with a crucifix in his hand and blessed them and then said a prayer with the soldiers about neighbourly love. He emphasised thereby the Ten Commandments, and above all the commandment, You shall not kill. Since this experience, his father had nothing more to do with the church and never went to church again. It all seemed too hypocritical to him. End of quote. Incidentally, during this war, the crucifix blessed weapons of the Germans killed more than 20 million citizens of the Soviet Union. Due to the merciless warfare of the German Wehrmacht, the percentage of civilians killed was particularly high. Another example. With best wishes for further work, Pope Pius XII also bade farewell to the leader of the Croatian fascists, Ante Pavelic after a private audience in the Vatican in May 1941. The further work that was already at that time declared, the expulsion, forced conversion and extermination of dissenters, namely hundreds of thousands of Orthodox Serbs. The Catholic slaughter in Croatia, according to the well-known author Karl-Heinz Deschner, took its course. The fascist Ustasha militia, which included many Catholic clergymen, swore obedience to their leader in front of two candles, a dagger, a revolver and a crucifix. Seen here on the cover of the book, Jasonovac, the Yugoslav Auschwitz and the Vatican. The crucifix was and is a tool with which the name of Jesus of Nazareth was often abused, as shown for militant and murderous purposes. Hence the title, The Falsified Jesus. One could also say, The Abused Jesus. This bloody cross was not only used for centuries for warmongering, as a symbol in brutal execution rituals and for processions with pagan ceremonies and garments, this false Jesus was spanned into the format of countless dogmas and beliefs, some of them bizarre. Not seldom they attack our common sense. Here is an excerpt of the dogma number 268 from the book The Teaching of the Catholic Church by Neuner and Rus about the nature of God Father and His Son. We confess also the Son born of the substance of the Father, without beginning, before time, for at no time did the Father exist without the Son, nor the Son without the Father. And yet the Father is not of the Son, as the Son is of the Father. For the Father was not begotten of the Son, but the Son of the Father. The Son therefore is God from the Father, and the Father is God, but not from the Son. He is indeed the Father of the Son, but not God from the Son. But the latter is the Son of the Father, and God from the Father. But in all things the Son is equal to God the Father. For His being born had no beginning and no end. It is to be believed that the Son was not generated or born from nothing, or from some other substance, but from the womb of the Father, that is, from His substance. The Father is therefore eternal, and the Son is also eternal. If he was always Father, he always had a Son, whose Father he was, and therefore we confess that the Son was born of the Father without beginning. Yet because he was born of the Father, we do not call this Son a part of the divided nature, but we assert that the perfect Father begot the perfect Son without diminution or division, for it pertains to the Godhead alone not to have a dissimilar Son, and this Son of God is Son by nature, not by adoption. 
of whom it must be believed that God the Father begot him neither by act of will nor of necessity. Doesn't that make your head spin? Jesus is even said to have founded a church, although the word or concept church did not even exist at that time. Also, people were very creative to attribute to Jesus of Nazareth the introduction of so-called sacraments, which he never brought into being in this way. Thus, the desecration of the corpse on the cross, in which a Roman soldier thrust his lance into the side of our Redeemer, was interpreted as the foundation of several sacraments at once. In the German Wikipedia, the church father, Augustine, is quoted as follows. As Christ slept on the cross, his side was pierced with the lance. Just as God created Eve from the side of the sleeping Adam, so from the wound in Christ's side the church shall be born. From the dead Christ, new life is born, the church and the sacraments. So now we know how the church and the sacraments came into being according to church doctrine. According to this official Catholic statement, through the desecration of the body of Jesus of Nazareth. As we have seen, the crucifix is often present when evil and therefore unchristian things happen in world history in the name of Christ. That is why we call him the falsified Jesus. Not only in crusades, the inquisition and the burning of witches or with the blessing of weapons, the crucifix also seems to be omnipresent among the mafia. On November the 15th, 2013, the Austrian Courier newspaper quoted the chief prosecutor of Reggio Calabria, Niccolo Crateri, as saying, The Drangheta, as the Calabrian Mafia calls itself, and the Church are closely related. Further, the Courier writes, Even if many Mafia godfathers are dead or in maximum security prison, the Mafia is alive. For years it has relied on close interaction with the Church and is continually expanding its power. In his 26-year career as a judge, Grateri has not seen a Mafia hideout without statues of the Madonna or crucifixes. On the other hand, we have the true Jesus of Nazareth the Prince of Peace and Redeemer, who came to the earth to teach people the way back to the light. Moreover, as an example for all his followers, because what he taught, he also exemplified. With the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus of Nazareth planted the seed that will sprout in everyone who lives his words. Moreover, he is the Redeemer, because 2,000 years ago, he transmitted a part of his divine energy to all souls and ensouled human beings, so that it is now possible to leave the wheel of births, the attraction of matter, with his additional power and thus to follow the path to our true homeland. Today, the world is characterized by the falsified Jesus. Thus, the representatives of the falsified Jesus have also accumulated unbelievable wealth. In Italy alone, 30,000 Catholic organizations own about 23% of all real estate in the country. How much the Church owns, apart from land and real estate, in other assets, can only be surmised. The Hamburg political scientist Carsten Frerk estimates the fortune of the two major churches just in Germany at about 500 billion euros. The news magazine Der Spiegel writes in its 49th issue in 2001, The Christian institutions are the richest entrepreneurs in the Republic of Germany. As a reminder, the true Jesus said the following to the people, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, it is not surprising when society follows this example of the falsified Jesus and also takes exactly this path. To be and to have is the motto, even if it is at the expense of nature, animals and people. The tracks that this sham Christian society of the falsified Jesus leaves behind are far-reaching and irresponsible. 
Nuclear waste alone is a deadly high-risk legacy for hundreds, even thousands of generations to come. And the true consequences of the proliferation of microplastics and genetically modified plants, the pollution of the oceans, nature and the atmosphere, will probably become fully apparent only very gradually, bit by bit. So what world are we living in? In the world of the falsified Jesus, where the production, sale and export of weapons are commonplace, especially for political parties that call themselves Christian. In a world where nature continues to be destroyed every day, where every day more than two million of God's creatures are killed industrially. In Germany alone, there are billions of so-called farm animals killed every year. They are mostly fattened with genetically modified soy and grains, for the cultivation of which more areas of rainforest are cleared every day. This does not seem to bother anyone much, and even the churches calling themselves Christian do not raise any serious objection or appeal to those responsible, apart from the usual bland words. Every year about 400,000 hobby hunters roam through the German forests and fields, killing millions of God's wild creatures with the blessing of the church. Although many national parks abroad have long since proven that the animal population regulates itself as soon as the animals are left alone. We live in a world where the strongest wins and takes everything and the weaker is marginalized. This sham Christianity of the falsified Jesus shapes our so-called civilization on a daily basis. Nature, the animals and the less well-off fellow citizens suffer from this. Citizens who cannot or can hardly pay their constantly rising rents. For example, an average salary of an artisan, or a hairdresser or a saleswoman, is often no longer enough for a life in the middle class, let alone for an upper middle class. Even the pensions at the end of a hard-working life are not enough for many of these people to live a dignified life in old age. As a result, more and more citizens are dependent on handouts from the state, and voluntary organizations have their hands full providing for the ever-growing number of needy people. In the past 14 years, the number of users of food banks, that is, of people who depend on donated food, has increased by more than 300%. In 2015, there were already one and a half million. Today, it is likely to be far more. The numbers are alarming. The number of homeless people without a permanent address has also risen steadily in recent years. On February the 14th, 2019, the internet portal of the German newspaper Zeit online read, Soon there could be 1.2 million people without a home. The numbers are alarming. Hundreds of thousands are homeless in the Federal Republic, especially in the big cities. Tens of thousands of homeless people sleep under the open sky, even in winter. And there are more and more of them. Why do people in rich Germany, the richest economy in Europe, have to live and sleep on the streets even in the cold winter? How does this picture fit into a society that claims to be Christian? Has the falsified Jesus led the society down a selfish wrong track? But what would the world look like if people followed the true Christ, the Christ with the resurrection cross, the victory cross? If a social system were not favoured in which the strongest wins, but the motto is common good before self-interest. There are examples of how this would be possible. A look at history will help us. During the last 1700 years, there have been many early Christian communities that lived or tried to live exactly like this. They were called Marcionites, Montanists, Manichaeans, Arians, Polyseans, Bogomils, Cathars, brothers and sisters of the free spirit, Waldensians, Hussites, 
Anabaptists, and many more. All these communities that followed the true Christ were persecuted, dispossessed, tortured, and in some cases hunted down and murdered to the point of total annihilation, or as it is said in Catholicism, eradicated in the name of the falsified Jesus. Their writings were largely destroyed. Much about them is known only from the files and interrogation protocols of their persecutors. And all this only, as already mentioned, because they did not follow the falsified Jesus, but the true Christ. As soon as people want to follow the true Christ and live his commandments in everyday life without submitting to the cult church and the falsified Jesus, they are a danger to the plans of the great dragon, as the prophet John symbolically called the dark power in his apocalypse. Many of these communities were so successful that they replaced the all-dominant church because they often had more supporters and sympathizers in their living area than did the prelates. The free early Christian community of the Bogomils, for example, lived for four centuries spread throughout the Balkans and other parts of Europe, replacing both the Orthodox and Catholic churches in a very large area. In response, the churches reacted as they always do. The apostate Bogomils were dispossessed, persecuted all the way to the mountains, expelled or killed. Not a single writing exists from them. Everything was destroyed. All that remained were very large hewn stones, about 150,000 in number, which still stand as silent witnesses all over the Balkans, telling of their life in community with nature and animals. Countless numbers of them were destroyed in the past and used for the construction of the railroad lines. One often finds the resurrection cross on the stones because the Bogomils rejected the crucifix. The resurrection cross or Christ with outstretched arms was considered by them as a symbol of overcoming death. In addition, one finds various symbols of peace and testimonies of a life in community. This community included nature and animals, because they rejected eating meat. Other stones are witnesses of their persecution, and one can see knights on horses with lances. The mystery of the stones has not been solved yet. Some probably served as gravestones. Perhaps they knew that their time was coming to an end, and they wanted to leave a lasting, practically indestructible message for posterity. In fact, they were produced and set up at a time when the Bogomils were facing their persecution and extermination, or that of the community of the Cathars in southern France, with whom there was a close connection. To get an idea of what life might be like in a community that does not rely on elbowing one's way upward and personal gain, but where one is there for the other, let's take a look at the life of the Cathar community. The Cathars exerted a great influence on religious and social life in southern France from the 12th to the 14th century. They were a role model for a pure life in the spirit of original Christianity before their culture and bodies were destroyed by the Inquisition. Their faith was also at odds with Catholic dogma ideology. From court records, it is known that the Cathars believed that the man Jesus was begotten by Joseph and not by a spirit. They believed that much of the Old Testament came from the bad God. Among other things, this probably refers to the calls for mass murder of women, children and entire peoples. But also the detailed page-long instructions from the old polytheism, which describe how animals are to be killed and sacrificed so as to be able to appease a supposedly enraged God and much more. It was clear to them that this material world was not created by God, but by bad gods. That is, by former celestial beings, 
who left the spiritual world because they wanted to be like God to themselves. For the Cathars, this earth was not their true home. They were aware that once you cling to possessions, you always want more of them, and can never get enough of them. This is why the Cathars lived in a community of common property, and according to the motto, common good before self-interest. All this can still be learned today from the torture records of the Inquisition, since all the Cathars' writings were destroyed. Thus, even parts of Revelations are preserved, which they had either from still-preserved old documents or were revealed to them by their own prophets. The following short excerpt of a revelation is handed down from a defendant named Pierre Maury, who put it on record before the Inquisition court in Lerida. And the Lord said, You will serve the foreign god in a land that is not yours, where you will have despair, illness, evil and hardship in this foreign world. For you will not be happy with the riches that Satan gives you, however much you get of them. The one who possesses them will want more of them, and you will find no rest nor end until you find your way back into my kingdom, for the world has no stability. The goal of the Cathars was a pure life in the spirit of original Christianity. They were aware that they were living only temporarily in this material world, a world created by the foreign god, and that has no stability. But who is the foreign god? Who is this evil god, as he was also called? It is probably the great dragon, the old serpent called the devil or Satan. As John of Patmos wrote in his Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Literally, he wrote, The dragon was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Revelations 12, 9 If one believes these prophetic writings, then the coarse material universe, as we know it, and thus also the earth and with it the human beings, originated as a consequence of this fall event, also fall of the angels, today also called the Big Bang. The Cathars knew that they were here in this earth school solely to ennoble their souls and to learn. Therefore they did not strive for their own possessions, and did not hoard goods, as Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, but practiced neighborly love. Their thoughts and aspirations were directed toward community life, in which they administered in a just manner the goods that God gave to all. For example, Ask Le Monde, probably the most influential Cathar, lived this as an example for her brothers and sisters in the spirit. She donated her castle of Montségur to the community. She is described as a blameless and noble Cathar, who practiced true Catharism. Her name, Esclamonde, means the noble one who brings the light of the sun to the world. Probably she was even a prophetic instrument of God in this community. This could be indicated by the quoted texts of Pierre Maury, which he gave on record before the Inquisition Court in Lerida. Because among other things, these texts describe also the origin of matter from the fall of the angels up to the emergence of solid matter, and with it, of the human being, which cannot be read in this depth in any ecclesiastical gospel. Without Esclamonde, the community of the Cathars would not have been so influential and their faith would not have become known beyond the borders. Like the early Christians, the Cathars generally rejected military service, hunting and the killing of animals. They ate a vegetarian vegan diet. They were popular everywhere because of their unselfish commitment to their neighbors. Their helpfulness and their simple way of life brought them much sympathy from the people. Their life was in stark contrast to the prelates. They proved that the Sermon on the Mount is not a utopia, as the theologians still claim today, but can be lived. With their knowledge, they helped people where they could. Thus, the women had extensive knowledge about the effects of medicinal herbs and were called upon to aid the sick and wounded with advice and deeds. 
The special quality of their craftsmanship, for example as tailors or weavers, was appreciated everywhere. But they were also active as teachers, and their wisdom and ability to make peace was also in demand as jurors in courts. They had established relationships in the houses of the rulers and gained their trust, which must have been a particular thorn in the flesh of the great dragon. The strict rejection of all the Catholic cults and rites, which are not found in a single word in the Gospels, ultimately became the Cathars' undoing. For they believed neither in the sacraments, nor that Christ had founded a church, or instituted a priesthood to act as a mediator between God and humankind. All Cathars who did not want to convert back to the ritual and dogma faith of the Catholic Church were persecuted and murdered during a crusade or the Inquisition. Thus ended another attempt to establish on this earth an alternative society that was more just and based on the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus of Nazareth. Practically a kingdom of peace, a Christian society or community worthy of the name, based on the common good. Isn't this a dream or longing of many people even today? To live in a society that pursues only peaceful goals. One that puts the common good before self-interest. A society in which everyone has a job, a place to live and enough to eat, in which there are no homeless people, because one serves the others, and assists and takes them in when they are in need? But is that feasible in an extremely unequal system in which 1% of the citizens, the top 100th, already own about 35% of the individual net wealth? The richest 10% together account for two-thirds of all wealth. On the other hand, the poorer 50% of Germany's citizens own only about one single percent of the total net wealth. Does this correspond to a just or even a Christian mindset? Wouldn't the peaceable vision of the Cathars, in principle, a life according to the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus of Nazareth, be an alternative? Fortunately today, religious fanatics and church leaders are no longer allowed to ignite funeral pyres and burn people who have exactly this goal. So how much longer do people want to remain in the clutches of the falsified Christ, thus helping to further destroy the earth? How much longer do people want to support the production of weapons and their advocates, thus, perhaps without being aware of it, supporting wars that cause much suffering and endless streams of refugees? How long will the citizens allow animals to be treated like objects, crammed tightly together, fattened and killed? Meanwhile, Germany is already the third largest pork exporter worldwide. How long should God's creatures in woods and meadows be killed by the millions by hobby hunters? And this, although it has already been scientifically proven, including through the experiences in many national parks, that animals in freedom can regulate their population themselves without hunting pressure, as they have done for thousands of years. When will we learn to distinguish between those who speak the truth and those who have stooped low and speak nice things with oily words, but who, in the truest sense of the word, are deceiving us? If the words were true and the intentions pure, why is society, nature and the earth in this miserable state? Why do 150 species die out every day? Why do we find ourselves on the edge of an abyss today? Why are so many people, even in our civilization, living in need and on the streets? Why do single mothers often have to fight so hard for a decent and dignified life? No amount of automated driving, 5G, digitalization or other highly acclaimed technical achievements will help us out of this dilemma. On the contrary, 
If just one domino in this illusory world falls over, it can trigger a chain reaction that blocks everything and ultimately paralyzes the entire modern society in the shortest possible time. And of course, as far as the vision of a better and peaceful society is concerned, the beginning lies with everyone themselves. Without first becoming peaceful oneself, a change in society is really only utopia. For example, being peaceful toward animals by empathizing with them and realizing the incredible suffering that is done to them by killing them and eating their body parts. It is of little help to them if they have previously been lovingly petted in accordance with organic practices. But also peaceableness toward one's fellow people, one's colleagues and co-workers, and also one's supervisor, one's partner, and one's children would be the order of the day. Not lastly, by not blaming one's neighbor, but by self-reflection, first seeking the cause of agitation in oneself instead of projecting one's own problems on others and thus harassing them. We cannot and should not want to change our neighbor. We can and should change solely ourselves. If we would only take this to heart, the world would be a more peaceful place. If one believes the prophecies worldwide, regardless of origin, then they all speak of an end of the world, whereby the planet is never meant, but the world of human beings. This probably means that everything that people have built against nature and of which they are so proud will fall apart again. The comforting thing is that, according to what has been passed down during and after this demise of the world, a new society will emerge. Many prophecies mention great natural disasters, diseases, pandemics and wars that will gradually terrify the world. Since these severe upheavals will probably cause the old rigid structures to dissolve, survivors will likely be given the opportunity to build a new, better world. At least, that is how one could interpret the old prophecies. But what will the future look like after this so-called end of the world? In an apocryphal gospel, first published by G. J. R. Usely in 1901, and known today in German under the title Das Evangelium des Vollkommenen Lebens, the Gospel of the Perfect Life, Jesus foretold how his teachings would be falsified in the future. But the time cometh when darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, and the enemies of truth and righteousness shall rule in my name, and set up a kingdom of this world, and oppress the peoples, and cause the enemy to blaspheme, putting for my doctrines the opinions of men, and teaching in my name that which I have not taught, and darkening much that I have taught by their traditions. Thus, Jesus of Nazareth already knew that his name would be misused to dominate and subjugate the people in the name of a counterfeit Jesus. But he also added comforting words to this. But be of good cheer, for the time will also come when the truth they have hidden shall be manifested, and the light shall shine, and the darkness shall pass away, and the true kingdom shall be established, which shall be in the world, but not of the world. In the ancient scriptures, including the Old Testament, there are prophecies that tell of a coming kingdom of peace after the dark time of doom. We find this, for example, in the prophet Isaiah from the 7th century before Christ. His words are handed down in chapter 11, verses 6 to 9, as follows. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. 
They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The prophecy of the prophet Enoch is one of the oldest of all. At the time of early Christianity, the first book of Enoch was still part of the collection of ancient writings. However, over the course of church history, this book, like so many other writings, disappeared. Only the Ethiopian church included it in its Bible. The following are a few sentences from the still extant Ethiopian book of Enoch. And then shall the whole earth be tilled in righteousness, and shall all be planted with trees and be full of blessing. They shall plant vines on it, and the vine which they plant thereon shall yield wine in abundance. And as for all the seed which is sown thereon, each measure of it shall bear a thousand. And the earth shall be cleansed from all defilement, and from all sin, and from all punishment, and from all torment. And in those days I will open the store chambers of blessing which are in the heaven, so as to send them down upon the earth over the work and labor of the children of men. And I will transform the earth and make it a blessing, and I will cause mine elect ones to dwell upon it, but the sinners and evildoers shall not set foot thereon. And in that place I saw the fountain of righteousness, which is inexhaustible, and around it were many fountains of wisdom, and all the thirsty drank of them, and were filled with wisdom, and their dwellings were with the righteous and holy and elect. Be hopeful, and do not cast away your hope, for ye shall have great joy as the angels of heaven. Another prophecy, attributed to John of Jerusalem, said to date from 1050, describes this coming time in great detail. These words also sound comforting and uplifting. The forests will again be dense, and deserts will have been irrigated. The waters will have become pure again. The earth will be like a garden. Man will watch over everything that lives. He will purify that which he has soiled. He will feel as if the earth is his home and he will be wise thinking of the days to come. Each person will be like a measured footstep. They will know everything about the world and about their bodies. They will cure illness before it appears. Each person will be healer of himself and the others. They will have understood that you have to help to be able to maintain. And man after times of narrow-mindedness and avarice, will open his heart and his purse to the poorest. He will feel himself to be a knight of the human order, and in this way a new time will at last begin. Man has learnt to give and share. The bitter days of solitude will be gone. He will believe once more in the Spirit, but that will come after the wars and the fires that will spring up from the blackened ruins of the towers of Babel. Man will no longer be afraid of his own death, and the light he will understand will never go out. Man will know that all living things are beings of light, and that they are creatures to be respected.